Now, you've got a new book out uh, about Muhammad, a tribute book. What, what are we going to read this time about Muhammad? Well, let's go back 25 years ago. I wrote a book called Muhammad Ali, His Life and Times, which is generally regarded as the definitive Ali biography. Muhammad Ali, a tribute to the greatest, contains everything I've written about Ali since then. It's really a companion volume to Muhammad Ali, his life and times. And it has everything from essays on the importance of Muhammad Ali to numerous personal recollections, whether it's looking back on going to a big football game at Notre Dame with him or going with Muhammad to the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. I think the two most important, actually I'd say there are three essays in the book that, that are among my favorites. The first is a long essay that draws comparisons between Ali and Elvis Presley, who of course was another first name, one name, icon. They were both southern boys who came from relatively poor families. In the beginning, they were curiosities for the newsroom on a slow day. Then they were, were regarded as dangerous revolutionaries. Elvis was going to lead young people into sex and rebellion. He was singing race music, which was considered horrifying at the time. Ali was going to lead black people into rebellion on the streets of America. Then they became beloved monarchs. Elvis went into the army. He came out. He was no longer the revolutionary young figure. You had the Elvis who was the king who was playing Las Vegas, making bad movies. Ali came back. He left the nation of Islam to convert to Orthodox Islam. He beat George Foreman. And he might have been at that point the most famous, most recognizable man on the globe, but he wasn't threatened to the establishment anymore. And then, sadly, at the end, they both end, ended up in, in, in really horrible condition. And Elvis was this bloated, morbidly obese, drugged out person lumbering around the stage and couldn't remember the words to songs. Ali had his own sad decline. But they were both so good when they were young. And, and this essay, Elvis and Ali, tracks the career trajectory of them. The second essay in the book that I think is enormously important is one called The Lost Legacy of Muhammad Ali. People have talked a lot in the past few weeks about how Ali stood up for his principles, but they have no idea what those principles were. They have a vague idea that he was an exemplar of pride for black people, but they don't understand that in the most important years of his life, he belonged to a group that preached a doctrine that Arthur Ashe referred to as a sort of American apartheid. Ali and the Nation of Islam believed that white people were devils who were created by an evil scientist with a big head named Mr. Yakub, that segregation was proper, that the races should leave separately. And it was a long, long journey for Ali. It wasn't just that America changed, Ali changed too. In a way, his journey was similar to that of Malcolm X, who belonged to the nation of Islam, then went to Mecca and came back, and as his words said that he now realized that pilgrims of all colors snore in the same language. So we really should understand the evolution of Ali. And this legacy, this essay, The Lost Legacy of Muhammad Ali, talks about how all the rough edges have been filed away from Ali, in large measure for commercial purposes. You saw that in the Will Smith feature film, Ali, where none of the cruelties to Joe Frazier were talked about. The phrase white devils appears almost as a throwaway in one sentence. And yes, it might make Ali more palatable for commercial purposes and marketing, but it's not who the man was. And his own journey is so extraordinary that it's a disservice to history and to Ali himself not to tell that story. The third essay in the book that I think is important is one that has never been published before. It's called The Long Sad Goodbye. We witnessed an extraordinary phenomenon with Ali, which is that 
For 30 years, the whole world watched this man wither away and die. And there's never been anything like that in history. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher each had a sad physical decline at the end. Each suffered from Alzheimer's disease. It would have been a very easy thing to dress Ronald Reagan up in a suit, bring him to a fundraiser, have him walk out on stage and wave, take him off stage. People would have roared, they would have made millions of dollars. But the people responsible for Ronald Reagan's safekeeping, and Reagan himself to the extent that he was able to make these decisions, chose a different path. With Ali, the decision was made to keep him in the public eye, and there were some good things that came out of that. I think it gave inspiration to a lot of people who were suffering from diseases, but also reminded the rest of us that these people we pass on the street every day, the old people who were in wheelchairs with their mouths open, sort of gazing vacantly into space, these are people, these are human beings, and Ali reminded us all of that. So, to that extent, there was something very positive that came out of it, but it was also sad to have to ask how those last 30 years will impact positively or negatively on Ali's legacy, what it does to the generations who didn't live through his time. Because to really understand Ali, you have to do an awful lot of homework, or you have to have lived through his time.